worked a huge amount of change over the past six months in terms of the, the outlook since we last did a European outlook um, back at the end of, uh, end of 2021. Um, we're going to start just with a, a kind of presentation from Stefan here um, to put in context some of the economics, what we're seeing in the market, um, and then we'll discuss that. And it's an open discussion. So if you've got questions on the live stream, do you do please put those in. And of course, if you've got questions in the room, um, then then let's let's share those. Um, but first of all, welcome to you, Stefan. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Richard. I just want to set the scene in the next sort of 15 minutes and because you know real estate people like to be quite positive so in terms of getting a discussion going later on I think um, playing devil's advocate and, and drawing a couple of the risks out a bit more probably is helpful in terms of uh, make it a bit more controversial than often these panelists can be where everyone agrees. Um, if I start with the Overall environment, I mean, this is a very simple chart, but I think the two things we have in mind as real estate investors, but what is happening to GDP growth and what is happening to inflation? Because if you get a recession, that definitely uh, has an impact on our occupier markets, um, something we haven't seen in a long time. Occupier markets are doing very, very well, um, basically since the Eurozone crisis. And on the yield side, obviously, we have had yields coming in until early this year continuously for um, a very long period since the GFC. So a change in interest rates and a possible change in the, in the yield environment is obviously something we um, can be very concerned about. There's a lot of other things around, you know, construction costs, what the listed market is doing, was the wider uh, financial market is, um, is bringing us. I mean, these are all things to keep in mind, but I think GDP growth and interest rates are the two big things um, for real estate. And if you look at um, forecasts, they're actually still, they tend to be still quite positive. Um, I've just taken a random one here. Usually they have two scenarios. There's just a bit of a slowdown of growth. We have high inflation, but it doesn't last very long. It goes away at some point next year. And then they usually have a negative scenario where we actually fall into a recession in Europe, plus um, the inflation doesn't go away that quickly and it's a bit higher than um, many forecasts so far have expected. But if you look at these, they're probably still, even the negative scenario is not that bad. I mean, the recession looks it looks relatively bad, but if you look at the inflation side, even that negative scenario uh, might be actually behind the curve if you looked at the numbers the, um, from uh, the ECB and from the UK coming out over the last couple of weeks. And if you put it in a bit of a longer context, I mean, either we have just that slowdown and we come out of um, quantitative easing, very low interest rates, sort of as expected. At some point, interest rates normalize. Um, we have a bit of a slowdown in the economy, but actually it's more normalization than really a disaster. Um, the middle scenario here is so that the, the, the stagflation is a bit more difficult because that would mean interest rates have to rise higher, have to stay higher for longer. Um, which also has an impact, obviously, on, on property prices and on prices in general in financial markets. And that can easily slip into sort of a stagflation where inflation just is too persistent and doesn't go away despite um, a lot of action from central banks, um, which in the end could lead to something which we haven't seen since the 1970s and 1980s. But I think most forecasters, that's why it's 10% here, put still a very low probability to that um, most problematic um, outcome. So what's the starting point for real estate? And I mean, we've all been used to yields coming in for a very long time period. And you probably have seen that chart many, many times, the yield gap between um, bonds and what real estate is yielding. And it was always the same story. It looks fine. Uh, yields have come in, um, but they have only come in line what bond markets and um, uh, the rest of you know financial markets have been doing in terms of valuations, real estate looked expensive historically, but it definitely wasn't expensive relative to other asset classes. And that's just end of last year. If you force forward now, and I've taken a slightly different chart here from, um, from Green Street, which have, they don't use the bond yields and they use their own outlook um, for real estate. And it's a quite positive one. That's, I think it's a very good uh, choice for that. And plot that against different types of bonds. Um, so more lower risk and higher risk ones. And so very quickly on that chart on the left, you see real estate has moved from actually quite cheap to fairly priced. But if you take the GFC period out, which is quite an extreme sort of um, um, period, um, you also can argue, and I see that on the right, that we're actually already in sort of overpriced scenario. So very quickly, 
moving from real estate is good value to real estate would need to reprice to accommodate and that change. And that's on the basis of really expecting that real estate on the occupier side, so in terms of income returns, is still going to continue relatively um, well over the future. Um, and just to put that change a bit in, in context, so that's financing costs. And um, the chart is just two weeks old, but I think it's already a bit out of date. I think um, if you get sort of Eurozone 10-year swap rates, 2.4%, add in the margin, you're close to 4% um, in terms of what you're paying for that. And we still have yields for the, the most sought-after thought, thought asset classes, like offices, below 3%, residential probably in many markets even closer to 2%. Um, so something quite fundamentally has changed here, which obviously is something the real estate sector has to digest um, in some way or other. So what we have done is looked at previous periods of changing interest rates and trying to quantify a bit how much change we might be expecting going forward. We've just done it over the last 20 years because if you go further back, financial markets have been so different, so it's not too clear how much you can glean from anything which happened in the 80s and 90s. But obviously the last 20 years have been quite special 20 years. So again, you know, it's only sort of a limited um, it is of sort of limited help, but it's of some help to help us to see what, what might be installed for us. And what you can see here is we have it for different markets and for different sectors, that definitely sort of the living sector is a lot more stable. So in the past, interest rates didn't have as much impact on that market than on the others. Um, so no surprise there. And the industrial and offices are the two which are usually more exposed. So you see more change in yields as a result of interest rates going up and down. The retail sector um, is not really helping us here because so much other things ha happen in, 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 in retail in that time period. So interest rate uh, was really the, the least of, of their worries. So I wouldn't put too much into, into these numbers. And if you take sort of a broad average of that, you would at least say 100 basis point shift in interest rates would mean property yields moving by maybe something like 50 basis points. And then just as a reminder, we just have seen a movement of 250 basis points uh, in financing costs. So, you know, something like a yield shift of a 100 basis points or more is, according to that, definitely not inconceivable. So it's not a forecast, but it's something to keep in mind that there's a risk of a shift of that magnitude possibly happening. What we also found is that real estate is slow. I mean, the direct market, um, or the listed market, has already changed quite substantially. But direct market tends to take a long time to work it through. I mean, this is based on valuation data, so you probably can take a year off to get sort of um, prime direct market market data. So there's some markets which have in the past reacted almost instantly, but it can take up to five years and longer actually for changes to work its way through. So um, the fact that we haven't seen very much movement in yields so far it's not an indicator that nothing's going to happen. It's just typical for what direct real estate is doing. Another thing I think we should look at in that context is that real estate has changed quite a bit um, over the last decade, and it, it become a lot more operational. So operational real estate plays a much bigger role overall than it has done in the past. And this slide is just showing it, looking at possible risk and opportunities that different way of investing in real estate could have in that uh, more challenging period. And I think in terms of the risks of that is, is all around inflation because you have operational real estate also has staff, it has input costs, so you're not just worried about what's happening directly on your, your, you know, your rental growth and your occupation, but you also have to worry is your operation actually um, profitable and higher costs, lack of staff and all these things can have a negative impact. On the positive side, operationally real estate is you have a lot more control. So you're not just a landlord which is sort of at the mercy of their tenants and their decisions. You actually can drive uh, a lot of your decision making and that can be near positive. So it depends really on which part of operational real estate to talk about and how much sort of mega trends are supporting that. Um, something like data centers, for example, obviously that trend towards is not going to go away, but you still have the problems with much higher um, electricity costs and all these things which might impact you as a landlord as well. What we also should look at is what sort of different types of investment strategies and how they have fared in more challenging periods. Um, this is some data from INREF looking at core and value-add funds 
and the thing I always find quite funny about that, if you take the average over that time period, uh, value adds and core a little bit exactly the same return, just for value add, you got more volatility. So brilliant. Um, but even if you don't completely believe these data, at least what it tells you is that in recessionary periods, obviously value add is doing not as well as core. Um, the last couple of years probably have been quite good for, for value add. It could add a lot of value. Um, but the more challenging it becomes on the um, on the economic side, obviously value add is is the one to watch. But on the other hand, once you're in a recession, obviously it's the best time to start investing in, in value add projects. Similar story around um, developments. I mean, here MSCI data points in the direction that here the problems have been a long, lot more longer lasting. It's not just one really negative year. Um, the fallout here from the GFC meant for a lot of markets that developments actually were sort of underperforming um, lower risk assets for quite a while. I mean, the chip C was a very special period. Not every recession is going to be as bad as that. Um, but still, it hints like development is, and that's probably not a surprise to anyone, uh, might be a longer lasting problem than just value adds. Um, on the positive side, it, this development cycle has been actually quite under control. So it's probably not going to be um, that much of a problem. Just a couple of words to each sector to put the different ones in context. Um, logistics, I mean, before that is one of the sectors which actually has reacted to interest rate changes quite fast and quite intense. I think this won't be the case this time around because logistics is still supported by very strong um, non-cyclical um, tailwinds. And our forecasting for rent growth are still quite positive across the board. Um, that might be curtailed a bit if there's a recession, but the overall story doesn't really change. So there's less of a, of a reason for pricing to adjust. Still, if you run a model on that, the model still tells you with a sort of interest rate change that we're currently seeing, you still would have an outward yield shift of about 50 basis points. But a lot of markets, that just takes from just below 2% to just above, um, just below 3% to just above 3%. So, I mean, not great, but definitely not um, uh, and a, and a disaster in any shape or form. Um, the retail sector is obviously very different. Um, here, in the beginning of the year, we thought it's going to bottom out. We have seen all the worst. Um, yields have repriced. Um, the rental side, occupier side, found its bottom. And from there on, you know, it takes a long and can only improve. Um, but obviously, a cost of living crisis and a consumer-led recession is not exactly um, helpful for retail. So I think on the occupier side, actually, retail will be stressed once again, um, but I would worry a lot less um, about the yield side in, in 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 retail simply because the yields tend to be quite a lot higher and that pressure from financing cost is not as high. And to our surprise, usually the extra you have, the extra interest rates or the extra margin you're paying for finance and retail is not as much as you would think. But apart from the UK, usually the add-on is not that much, um, um, to some extent to our surprise, but um, that makes retail actually a lot more investable if you if you can stomach that especially something like um, retail warehousing if you look at the yields there um, they look in many markets despite um, our occupier market downturn quite quite healthy and um, something you can actually work with the office side here I mean again growth we actually gonna think it's gonna remain positive overall for the next couple of years that forecast is about a month old and I would say probably it's a bit too positive to what we, we have seen recently. Um, gateway markets are a bit better than the other markets, but um, still overall in positive territory. Um, the reason why we are still quite positive about this is, is simply the the building cycle and the vacancy levels in a lot of markets is actually quite low. So it goes into a recession in a, a very different shape than it did, um, for example, around 2001 when there was massive overbuilding um, and for years to come, which the office market had to digest. It's, it's definitely not the case in almost any of the markets. Still, yields have come in enormously, and the pricing is priced in a way, office is priced in a way as, as if it would be a growth factor. And that is sort of where the question comes in. Is, is that pricing really appropriate for a sector which probably has um, a relatively muted um, growth outlook, even in the best scenario? Which means, even if you're very, very positive, you have to factor in probably some of yield shift, even if, as I said, it's a month old, 25 basis points, looks a bit light um, in the current environment. Um, just to 
sum up, I think there's sort of three big risks we, we have to look at. What's happening with inflation? That's driving everything else. Um, are we getting a recession or not? And what does that do to interest rates? And I mean, that is a very simple chart, but it sort of gives a bit of an idea that these three things don't um, um, affect every sector and every strategy in the same way, depending where you get the most stress out of these three different sectors and different investments will, will fare differently. Obviously, something like a recession is not that bad for that investment as long as, long as you have relatively long LTVs. But um, very high inflation in debt investments and real estate is still fixed income, so that's a problem. Um, like I said, the living sector is, in the past has not been affected by interest rate as much as other sectors. And like the retail sector, you probably would want to worry more about the occupier side in a recession than rising interest rates in contrast to logistics and offices. Um, our, the analysis previously showed that real estate is slow, which means currently we have the environment has changed, but in real estate pricing hasn't changed yet. And that's not unusual, but it means it's a bit of a period where a lot of investors will sit on their hands and just wait for markets to adjust. Um, which is obviously something no one in the industry likes because that means nothing is going on for a while and you have to wait for a new balance to be found. Um, I think we're quite optimistic here saying end of the year we probably have seen enough price movement that more people are coming back to the market. So part evidence shows it takes a lot longer because this time around industry rate change have been so fast, maybe also real estate is a bit faster to adjust uh, this time around. And just sort of in summary, the different sectors, I think we think the, the tailwinds for logistics and for the living sector are still there. I mean, there's again a chart on Green Street, but I think it's quite what the consensus in the industry is. Off is a bit more muted and uh, retail sort of bumping along at the bottom there. At least it doesn't seem to get uh, much worse um, from this point. So in the end of the day, if you invest now, um, is there any sort of incentive to be active in the market now. I think if you're active now, you, you know, the opportunity cost of that is simply that in, in a six months time, is, is anything going to be more expensive than today? Um, for the last 10 years, the answer was always in six months time, it's going to be more expensive, so better invest now. I think that has turned around. It's probably much more likely to be cheaper, so why would you do anything now? Um, the, the same way is true for capturing growth on the occupier markets. Maybe there is more growth coming through, especially logistics uh, in some areas in residential. But is it as much to compensate you for the risk? And you know, is it really so bad to lose on a, out of six six months of growth? The only area where I think remaining active is quite important for investors is around building relationship and being ready when the music starts playing again. And setting up operations and getting into markets takes a very long time. So stopping that now and trying to do that again in 2003 when you told your new partners uh, things are off is probably not a great idea. So it's probably a good time to build new relationships, get into new markets, but it's probably not the best time right now to put a lot of money to work. Back to you, Richard. Great. Thank you, Stefan. That's super. Um, and you can now take your allocated place on the on the panel. There are loads of loads of information there to to, to feed through. Um, and if the other speakers could come up, that would be great. Um, on your right hand side um, of the screen, um, you can ask questions, you can do those kinds of things on the on the live stream. And of course, here you can just ask questions. Um, let's let's just start with um, quick introductions. Um, Maybe if we, uh, if, if we start with you, Stefan, because you didn't introduce yourself there. True. And for those who don't know me, although I think I probably do know everybody here, <laughs> but for those who may not know me there, um, my name's Richard Betts. Um, I'm the group publisher at Real Asset Media. Um, we run a series of magazines, news lines, around 60 events a year, um, including a, a standard expo real and various things like that. And you can find out about all of that on the website, and I won't bother you with it now. Um, Stefan, over to you. Uh, thanks, Richard. Stefan Wunderach. I look after the research team here in London um, for our European investments within within Nuveen. I've been in, in that role for the last 16 years. Um, we are investing in sort of all the main sectors and advising our clients from retail to logistics internally and externally and in Europe and around the world. Great. Thanks very much. Audrey. Um, so I've been in real estate for about 20 years. Um, I uh, ran my own real estate company for five years, 
And then I um, ran a division of Blackstone for 10 years. And I sit on the board of two real estate companies and have rolled out their ESG strategies and their sales and fundraising strategies. Super, thanks. David. Thanks. Um, my name is David Inskip. I lead the UK research team at CBRE Investment Management. Um, CBRE Investment Management, one of the world's largest real assets investment managers with about $150 billion worth of AUM. Um, my role there is to really advise on the strategy for the UK business, run our house views process, and just keep our, our fund portfolio transaction managers abreast of market events. Great, thanks. Asim. Hi, Asim Malami. I'm head of international origination group within uh, Berlin Hip. Berlin Hip is a German senior lender with 26 billion of uh, loans on, on, the, on the balance sheet, and, um, and we're one of the biggest uh, issuers of green bonds and uh, fund brief. Perfect. Thanks very much. Um, we won't go through everybody who's here, um, but delighted that you did make it, given that it's a, it's, a, it's a transport strike. So thank you also to everybody here in the room for, for making it here on time. Um, let's just start maybe with, with you, Asim. Uh, I mean, as, you know, huge changes over the last six months. So I suppose, um, how do you assess the markets at the moment, because we've obviously had the geopolitical side, we've had the war in Ukraine, we've had inflation, interest rate rises. Um, so I suppose, put that in perspective for what that means for you on the banking side. Well, first of all, um, you use the past tense, I would say we, we will have all of that in, in the near future, and that makes it a little bit uh, difficult to, to forecast. I, um, what I do see, though, is that the the low-risk uh, products in the market, and especially when it comes to scarce uh, uh, EU taxonomy-compliant uh, uh, core products, for example, uh, they will remain scarce, and uh, I wouldn't expect that to to move a lot in terms of, of yield shift. Um, on the rest, well, as uh, um, David pointed out earlier, I think there will be a shift in, in, in the risk premium, and that's where we will... Uh, look more attentively, of course, as a senior lender, where risk lies and where we want to engage our, our capital. Okay, good. And Audrey, it may be interesting just, just to pick up with you, you know, having seen a number of cycles here, and and Stefan mentioned there in the, you know, the presentation, the, the kind of global financial crisis and the impact there. Um, I suppose, how do you see that um, in terms of discussions with investment capital pension funds, now in comparison to then? What, what's, your, what's your take on where we are now? Sure. Um, and just to expand on, on what Stefan said before, um, there are certain asset classes that are considered to be very defensive. So um, to those of us who lived through 2008, 9, and 10 saw a complete standstill here in Europe. Nobody was talking to anyone about anything except for how miserable they were. And, um, and what I'm seeing now is that people are being more selective. So by selective, I mean they're looking at living strategies and they're looking at logistics, where there is a, a, a significant amount of growth depending on what market you're in. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Okay, so glass half full very much there. Good. Um, and David, actually, that picks up, I mean, in a way then, I mean, that, that trend was already underway um, in terms of that focus on areas like logistics and, uh, and what Audrey is talking about there in terms of defensive asset classes, living. Um, so I suppose, how do you see that? Has it, ha, I mean, A, have you changed strategy there at all? Um, and is it still driving into some of these, these ongoing trends? Yeah, I think those, those structural trends that we were talking about before, um, yeah, logistics and residential being two great examples, those tailwinds are still there. What we're talking about today on the more negative side is probably more, more cyclical impacts. So I don't think what we've seen is something that's really, say, led us to, to shift our allocation across strategies or across sectors, um, but it does give us sort of um, pause for breath. I think at the moment, Looking back on what we've seen change in the global economy over the first half of the year, it looks like there's going to be some sort of broad-based impact on the investment market, but we're not yet at a point where we're calling out sort of a specific sector that looks particularly vulnerable um, in a structural way in terms of the occupier markets. Um, and 
maybe just coming to you, Stefan. I mean, you 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 mentioned there um, capital maybe taking a pause, or that there's you know less incentive, less urgency to get into the market in a way at the moment um, in terms of doing deals. Um, does that is that reflected in a in a kind of strategy change here? Um, are you looking at? I mean, is is the strategy to be out of the market for a little while in terms of deals? Are you not progressing deals you've already started? What what what's the situation? I mean, you definitely agree with you know everyone here that the strategy hasn't changed and the wall of money which is always talked about is still there. It's just we know from previous recessions that that wall can pause and it does, and that people sit on the sidelines for a while um, in order to write you know what's happening maybe to reallocate between regions, maybe at some point between sectors, even if I, I don't see that now. And it's definitely what we're hearing from, I mean, our company is mainly US-based. The US market it reacts a lot quicker and a lot more sharply than we ever see in Europe. So over there, the music really has stopped for a while. Um, I agree, it's definitely not as bad as it was after GFC, but the feeling is you're not gaining from investing now and you, you probably raise for slightly better opportunities Sometime down the line, end of the year or, the, or early next year, you don't want to spend all your dry powder now. Okay. And I said, are you seeing that reflected in the financing markets in terms of, I suppose, the people coming to you? Are you seeing less activity, more activity, similar activity? What, what, what are you seeing? Uh, it has been a, quite an active year up to now. So I can't say that it's uh, we, we've... Uh, We've had a large drop in activity. However, the um, the uh, pace of transformation uh, of the project is much slower. And yes, there are some some transactions which are being called off in the last minute. So there is something of that, but the effect is not huge for the moment. And is that kind of country specific, or is that sort of broadly across Europe? I mean, I'm just wondering whether there's you know. Investors are less keen to focus on CE, for example, or uh, are you seeing that as broadly the same across markets? Well, um, you could probably um, make an analysis country per, per country. I mean, there's a, there's a, um, certain international investors are a bit uh, cooler when it comes to CE, but then on the other hand, we see Scandinavian or regional Czech, for example, Czech investors going into Poland, investing there. And then the Netherlands is quite slow. In France, it is also slowed down by the political environment. So there are a lot of factors uh, which are playing into into that situation at the moment. Okay, good. Um, and uh, Audrey, you're you, you know you're seeing a lot in terms of the capital raising side. Um, what are you seeing? Are people still actively raising? Is there still appetite? I mean, Stefan mentioned the wall of money, um, and that didn't appear to be changing, but maybe with interest rates, maybe some people may be looking back at bonds rather than real estate. But what's your sense of that? It's a, it's a mixed bag. You know, I, I keep going back to these these two asset classes, li anything related to living and and industrial slash logistics. Um, their things seem to be alive and well. You know, um, I've seen the slight slowdown, but not a not a stop or a pause. Um, you know, some people are saying, "Well, let's uh, let's get together after after the summer," but I still have a full calendar until mid July. So, um, you know, I'd say I'd say it's probably half and half. I mean, you know, and certainly um, people are gravitating towards as a classes that they think are going to be safeties. Okay, and if anybody wants to have a meeting. Uh, then it's obviously until September for you. Then, <laughs> what the sounds of that? Um, that that that's interesting. Um, and I suppose from from your point of view, David, how do you see the? Because there's various discussions around logistics, whether yields are actually a little bit too sharp. Are we really going to be able to see? You know, especially as interest rates rise in different countries potentially as well, um, that that may. Uh, you know, influence people's desire to move, you know, to to move into the logistics space at the moment. W what's your sense of that? Um, yeah, well, if I if I could just address, like, follow on from the previous point first. I think everything that's been said is is valid. I think there's still a lot of capital out there looking for real estate opportunities. I would say the difference that I see when I talk to our investors is 
is a change in urgency. So six months ago, there was a real urgency to put that money to work in the market. That money hasn't evaporated, but there isn't the same, there isn't the same urgency today. And I think we will have a bit of a period where um, the, the expectations of, of buyers and sellers need to sort of realign. And that's kind of what Stefan was explaining, I think, in his investment purgatory before. And I, I like him, hope that it's, uh, that's cleared up by, by Q4 and we can, we can go again. Specifically on the um, logistics point, I think, yeah, yields are, are very sharp by historic standards and by comparison to, to fixed income yields, for example. But we have seen a complete shift in the nature of what logistics offers you. I mean, it is now a more institutional um, part of the market. It's more professionally run. And of course, the expectations for income growth are considerably higher than they were before the internet, before the supply chain disruption. And those things um, uh, can give you some, some justification. Does that mean that, uh, that yields are uh, unvulnerable to, to moving out? No. Um, we've already seen in the UK that actually there's, there's quite a lot of stock on the market at the moment. We've had an absolutely stellar run of performance, and it's not really a surprise that some people are thinking about taking some profit. Um, that's slightly changed the, the dynamic of the market. And also the availability of debt, which is now much more expensive. So we've seen a bit of a weakening of demand, um, particularly at the, at the larger asset sizes and for the big portfolios where debt's so important. But even if those yields move a little bit, I think what you have to remember is for most people, their entry point wouldn't have been Q1 of this year. And even if you were, you were entering in the middle of last year, then, then your gains over that period have been so strong that a, a little bit of yield, outward yield movement um, through the rest of this year actually still leaves you in a pretty good position. And uh, Stefan, maybe coming to you with this first, anyway, I mean, are you expecting to see a transition in terms of pricing? You know, are people going to just have to accept that certainly for some um, there's going to be you know, transition to lower pricing. Um. Sort of, I mean, if you, the only thing which has really changed is the interest rate. So for us as an investor, it means um, if you leave everything the same, the return is lower if you make an investment now. And, but at the same time, we have a more uncertain outlook that possibly is a recession. There's definitely a more challenging period ahead. So especially our internal capital says, why should I invest in a market now where I get a lower return with higher risk. So if more investors think like that, then there should be an adjustment at some point. And the only thing which can really adjust is uh, anything around the yield. And if it comes, I mean, a lot of investors have started in the last couple of years to invest more into development and value adds to get sort of develop the core and these sort of strategy. And they're usually the variable where I think will be changing is land values because that's sort of the residual where I mean, currently, every developer tries to avoid that, and you know maybe we can squeeze a bit out on the construction cost here and here and there, but that's not really cutting it. And if you look at how land values have increased over the last 10 years, it's enormous in some cases. So, I mean, to David's point, if they go back a bit, it's not like they're making a massive loss. It's just the overinflation of that um, is taken out of the market to some extent. So I think um, land values and yields are the two variables where we're going to see some change over the next six months. How much depends on everything else, but there I, I would wait for some adjustment. Okay, and if the cost of debt is going up, are we going to see more uh, equity versus debt in, in, in the deals, if, if, if that's a way of changing the return? Uh, yeah, I mean, what we, what we see on uh, buildings which are on the market, there's not as many bidders as before. There's still more than one, so there's still competitive tension. And the bidders, especially for the core assets, and um, you know, we've talked about that prime and good real estate, defensive real estate is something still people want to be invested in. And that tends to be often the case, people who are uh, happy to go without equity, or be without financing, all, all in equity. And um, that plays definitely a bigger part of the market. But what that also means, I mean, if you take 50% financing for most deals, if that financing goes away, that means there's only half the capital to be invested in the market. That already makes quite a big difference in terms of how much volume uh, and trading you're seeing um, if it's just down to low leveraged or no leveraged buyers. 
Okay, good. And, and Asim, I suppose, what's what's your take on that? What are you seeing at the moment um, in terms of the, the leverage side of people looking for slightly less leverage? Are they, you know, what's the position? Well, um, I can only repeat what, what uh, uh, Stefan just said. Uh, um, the, the usual uh, amount of leverage doesn't work anymore with, with low yielding uh, properties. So uh, the leverage is being readjusted. Um, and, and I think sometimes uh, they will consider to not leverage at all, which is a shame for us, but <laughs> that's the way it goes. Um, the interesting part is what will happen with all the others. Will we, uh, if we have a readjustment of, of, of uh, yields and, uh, and a uh, widening of uh, risk uh, premiums, will that make it more easier to, to, to finance? I don't know. I don't, to be honest, I'm, I'm sort of trying to, to get my head around that as well. And do you think there's likely to be more sort of MPL activity and those kinds of things if we, you know, you know, if we're heading, you know, there was recession, there's higher interest rates, there's people recovering already from the pandemic. Um, what's your sense of that? Is there, is there a more kind of tricky time ahead potentially? Well, of course, uh, the, the times get a, bit, get a bit more complicated. However, what we need to um, remember is that there's already a huge chunk of, of uh, equity in the market. So it, nothing, no, no, not comparable with the pre uh, GFC situation where we had uh, leverages of 70, 80, sometimes more percent. Today, the leverage is more like uh, at an average between 50 and 60 percent, which is uh, uh, quite resilient to a situation like this one. Okay, good. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to come to the sectors in a minute, but I just wanted to pick up on um, particularly ESG, not least because you're here, um, Audrey. But in the, in the kind of previous crisis, ESG was rising, 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 rising as a focus, and then ESG came and everybody, uh, sorry, the, the crisis came and everybody kind of forgot about it to a certain extent. Um, very much been back on the, on the agenda significantly. Um, is there a danger of that happening again, or is this now uh, either because of, um, you know, European legislation, but also the drive from the investment side, is this still going to be an absolutely key trend? Sure. Um, so ESG has been a topic since 2008. It's been slowly building. Um, you haven't heard nearly as much about it as you have in the last two years during the pandemic. I mean, there were great strides made. And this is um, bottom up and top down. So there are two really important pieces of legislation coming out called um, SFDR and European Taxonomy. And... Both of those are going to put boundaries and pressure on companies and what they're doing about ESG and how they're treating ESG. A lot of groups are, are, are looking, so investors are not really entertaining investments unless people have some kind of ESG strategy. And that's mostly Europe. Okay, so um, the US and Asia are taking a very different pace about this. That being said, New York came out with a law called New York Common Law 97, which basically says that any building over 20,000 feet, which isn't that big, um, is subject to penalties if they haven't reached certain criteria by 2024, which is just around the corner, and even more so by 2030. Boston just came out with a similar, with a similar law. So it's happening, and it's certainly, it had to happen, and it's, um, it's, it's one of the silver linings of the pandemic. You know, um, but, uh, you know, a lot of people are trying to get their heads around and, and are trying to figure out, you know, exactly um, what what it means to roll out an ESG strategy. And, and there's some really good consultants out there, such as Evora, that have taken the lead and, and have really been helpful in this regard. Um, you know, I think um, that the big concern that investors have is if, if we don't jump on the CSG bandwagon, um, we're going to invest in, in assets that are going to be devalued over time. You know, so that's, you know, it's not necessarily that people have become, you know, really kind of conscious about the environment and extra good people or anything like that. You know, it's, um, they're worried about their investments losing value more than anything else. Okay, so there's more of a concern around stranded assets or, or a general kind of drop in, in values. Um, and uh, Asim, what's driving it from your point of view? Because obviously um, you've taken quite a positive stance there in, in terms of... Uh, 
the green bonds and those those kinds of those kinds of things. Um, is that also a concern from a business point of view, a commercial point of view around the kind of stranded assets or those those assets losing value over time as well? Of course, um, ESG is a is a or the non ESG compliance is a risk factor which we will which we will consider in our in our lending decisions. And uh, on, on the on the other hand, it's also uh, part of a defensive and a, and a value creation strategy that we see. So uh, yes, I, I don't think that ESG will go away any any, any time. I mean, there's too much momentum, and it, there's also a necessity. I mean, regulation and all this is very nice, but let's just face it: we we're going towards a a, a wall in terms of uh, uh, climate change. And we, no matter what recession, no matter what inflation does, we need to change the way we were dealing with real estate beforehand. Okay, good. And is that tr true as well for for both CBRE, IM, and... Yeah, 100% agree. It's not, not going to go away because it's too far down the line and you know, it's trying to set the motion. I think the only risk I see is like, there was a debate, is that they're going to be at green premium or a brown discount. And so far, we probably had actually more evidence for a green premium, which was very good for investors. But in a recession, that easily can turn around. And you're not seeing people paying extra for the more sustainable building, but paying less for the less sustainable building. So, which is obviously not as good for the fund management industry because everyone has some brown building somewhere. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree. I just think that it's, it's a wave now that has so much momentum. There's, there's no turning back. Um, and I think it becomes part of when we talk about recession and I'm, we talk about things like, you know, people concentrating on prime or the best quality assets. Well, when you go back to the GFC, the ESG considerations weren't a part of that definition. They weren't really considered as, is this, is this the perfect asset? Is this best in class? You didn't really ask the ESG questions. Now those questions are, are sometimes the first questions you ask about an asset. So... It really, it really has fundamentally changed, I think, and it's, it's only going to continue in that direction. And is that the first, I mean, is that the case also here that it's, for Nuveen, that it's one of the first questions on the book and the same for you, Asim? Yes, absolutely. I, I can say that from um, the, the current, the deals that we closed this year, 60% were green buildings. And, uh, um, uh, and, and that every time we assess an, uh, a deal, we do look at the ESG agenda. What is happening with, with, the, with the building? If, if, if we have a brown building which will be transformed into a green building, that's uh, great, that's fantastic. We like, we like the, to incentivize our clients to, to do so. But if, the, if there's a brown building with, where we don't have any perspective of, of turning it into green, we will probably not finance it. Okay. And the, the transformation side, quite a bit of capital being raised for, for transformation generally. Um, how do you see that as an investment strategy? I mean, again, that seems to be something along with living and, uh, and logistics that may well be quite defensive because it's got to happen over a period of time. Uh, are, we, are, we, are we putting that into our bucket of things that, uh, that could be successful? Yeah, I think there are a lot of investors already trying to do that transformation story, but pricing made it very difficult because the discount you got from a building which needs a lot of work was... Not very much. And I think that's something which could be changing over the next seven months. So you get an appropriate discount that you actually can make the investment um, to turn a building around. Okay, good. Um, I wanted to drill down a little bit into some of the, some of the sectors. Um, office, um, how do we see that? Obviously, big changes here in terms of, uh, of office. Um, you know, are people going to be going three days a week? Are they going to, you know, before they weren't going at the weekends, but nobody really worried about that. Um, how do you see that? And, and obviously, mostly, you know, a lot of these deals are two, three, four, five years away. Um, but is there a fundamental change in terms of occupier need? And is that going to mean less space overall? I mean, I accept what, you, what you're saying about the relatively tight development markets and things like that. But but how do we how do we see that topic? Maybe let's start with you on on that one, David. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, best and the rest is a is a nice catchphrase that's been used a lot, and I think it does still sum up a lot of the way we think about the office market. Um, 
uh, I think through the pandemic, we were that was our thinking, and we were quite focused on 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 two factors. One was yeah, the quality of an office needed to encourage people to come back into the city, but also the uh, the ESG compliance of those assets. And actually, I would say now we're more weighted towards thinking about the ESG compliance. We think that that will be the bigger of the two factors. But um, I do think yeah, we're still we're still on a bit of a journey in in that regard as to how people will use the office. I think it's quite difficult actually to be to be. We're just going through an office refurbishment ourselves, and it's quite difficult to know exactly the specification to aim for because we're still used to that five days a week in the office world, and it takes a bit of time to get used to the the more hybrid which we're we're aiming for of being in two or three days a week, and I think that will that will still take some some time to work through. If we need less office space in aggregate, possibly slightly less, I think we'll need. Um, we'll need more per person because of the way we'll use the space. Um, I don't just mean that in the sense of having a bigger desk or being worried about being near to people following the pandemic, but just having different spaces for different purposes. Um, whether that fully offsets the the shift to to some remote working, um, I think that the jury's still out. I think we're still going to need an awful lot of space on on Wednesdays and. Uh, corporations are going to accept the fact that they're probably going to have a lot of empty space on Fridays. And how, how are you building that? I mean, are you taking, has your view on office as a lender changed, um, Asim? Um, well, yes and no. The, the, um, no, because we, we still think it's uh, part of our core activity. I mean, the living space and office space is probably the, the, the most uh, popular um, piece of real estate. Um, we all use those those two. Um, we do see, however, that there um, we we have to look into the attractivity, the the, uh, the appeal of of, of uh, the this professional living space. Let's put it in, uh, name it this way, and and to see if that's there's a sustainable demand for that, and. That goes hand in hand also with the ESG thing because the, the well-being is also part of ESG and, and indirectly. So uh, in a way, yes, it's it's for the time being we're we're also um, we see that the market is sort of trying to find uh, its way, and we're not smarter than 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 the investors or the the, the occupiers. But I think the 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 equation is quite clear um, that well-being is determining the uh, productivity and, and in the end um, the, the talents that you want to attract will define how that space is used. And is there a, a larger focus in terms of the location? I mean, David mentioned there that, you know, best or nothing, <laughs> sort of. Um, is that also the case that your kind of focus in terms of lending is very much on those kind of prime assets, really? Yeah, the, again, it goes, it's, it's about attractivity of office space, right? And and uh, we're, we, we as a company, we're, we're currently um, building a new headquarter office and we, we are uh, um, um, building a, an office in, in with, the, with the aim of, of providing <coughs> adaptable um, office space, um, sort of what you just said, um, t adapted to different needs and also um, so that the, the people um, will be productive in, in a, in a well-being environment and not so much about it's not so much about efficiency of surface I mean that's of course always part of, of a economic decision but it's it, that's not the main objective it's about providing the, the, the employee who's present the, the best environment to to be as productive as possible Okay, good. Um, I mean, it was interesting, Stefan, we had a session which was on uh, the outlook for France and discussions there that actually weren't in the session itself, but had been in the, the pre-discussion, um, that there were some assets that were kind of the keys were being posted back um, in Paris office just because they were kind of in the wrong place. Um, and neither occupiers, they just couldn't lease them because occupiers didn't want them. Um, so is there a you know is there a danger of that? Is there a focus of that from you as an investor as well on on the kind of selection 
um, of offices and, and where they are in, in you know, looking more, you know, is, is there far more risk now that you're having to take it on board? I completely agree with that best in the rest phrase. I mean, that's true for offices probably globally. But it, I think what we sometimes forget is that countries can be quite different. I mean, we sit in our London bubble where we know offices are relatively lightly occupied and I have my US colleagues and I rarely see any of them in an office. So in the US, they almost think like offices in the retail um, because yes, so much in the working practices has changed. But then you travel to Japan or to Italy or Spain and nothing has changed. So I think we also have to be quite, um, you know, quite clear in which city, in which working environment um, the office is placed and the demands for people, or also the willingness of people working from an office in a smaller city with a sh uh, short commute time is very different to US cities or London where commute times tend to be very long and people are a lot more keen to not spend five days in the office and that informs your strategy. Um, so, you know, in, in London now we look for something quite different to what we look for in, in Madrid or Milan in, in the office space. And interestingly, I had a conversation with somebody who said that he was now back in the office five days, five days a week just because he couldn't face answering the door for any Amazon packages for the rest of his family any longer. So, so there may, there may be, that may be a good sign for logistics and for office, perhaps. Who knows? Um, it, it would be good just to drill down into some of, some of the other sectors. Um, David, let's start with you. Hotels and, hotels and leisure, how do you see that um, coming back after the pandemic? Um, w w what's your view? Hospitality, I think, is yeah, a really interesting area at the moment because clearly we have the, the cost of living squeeze and um, you don't necessarily think that you want your businesses to be consumer facing right now. And that seems like an area where, where people could cut back. Um, but one of the things that I hear a lot, actually, is that while that's going on, sort of the family holiday is one of the things that's been ring fenced. After two years of not going anywhere, people actually aren't uh, prepared to make sacrifices there. And I think anyone who's yeah, tried to book a, a holiday or a, a hotel room in recent months will probably tell you that they've been quite surprised by how much that now costs, thinking back to a couple of years ago. So on the face of it, some, some headwinds there. And I do think we still have some, some working through to do following the, <clears throat> the, the pandemic to really know which operators, etc., will come out on a on a firm footing, and which maybe still have some some problems bubbling along. But uh, actually, in the in the here and now, it does seem like hotels, in particular, are, are a space that um, have have quite good pricing power and are managing to maybe uh, capture some of that that higher inflation in that. Of course, when you go a bit further out and think more structurally. Will there still be the same amount of corporate travel um, following the pandemic? Probably not, I, I would say. I read an interesting survey the other day um, of corporate travel managers, and they were saying they expected even in a couple of years' time their corporate travel requirements to be about 20% lower than they were before the, the pandemic. Now, that's not, not a disaster because you have the leisure mix as well, but I think that is just something to be aware of. Okay, good. Any other views on, Stefan, your take on that? Um, I mean, just in, in a wider context, the point that I try to allude to in, in the presentation is about operational real estate. Yes, hotel room is more expensive, but also their costs have gone up, um, which might curtail their you know, ability to pay the rent to the landlord or our ability to raise rents on that. So. The inflation story puts quite a lot of pressure on, on operations and especially in the leisure sector where, I mean, especially in the UK where simply you can't, there's just no staff, but even in the rest of Europe there's a bit more flexibility in the labour market, a bit more slack. Um, you, you see similar things happening where there is no one who is closed or you have to at least raise your game in terms of um, paying for staff and paying for inputs which is not ideal in the end for the property owner either. Okay, good. Um, let's, let's just pick up um, retail a little bit. Um, obviously, over the past two years, less of a focus on shopping centres, um, fast fashion, those kinds of things in terms of the retail side, but, but more on food, local. 
Um, is that going to still be the same, or do we see that there's a chance for? I mean, there, there have been more shopping centres being traded recently. Um, has it reached the bottom? Is it on its way up? What's, does anybody have a sense of that? I think Stefan sort of summarised this quite nicely in his slide, where we felt we felt very similarly at the the start of this year that we were that we were getting there, and that there was a bit more optimism around the, the sector more widely. Um, and I think that's that's needed in particular for for shopping centres where you don't have another angle necessarily. Um, but again, the the economic developments, the cost of living squeeze, have have sort of put that onto the <coughs> the back foot a little bit. Um, personally, I think that that actually there are still interesting opportunities there. I think where you have the the rebasing of yields, probably the the rising in interest rates is is less relevant to that sector. But it's going to be uh, yeah another difficult period in in occupier markets and and can you look through that at the at the longer term if you're prepared to do that over say a a five year horizon I think probably there's some uh, some good possibilities there. Although there are some markets, you know, again we're we're speaking generalities across Europe, but um, there are some markets like Spain where pre pandemic there was only a four percent internet penetration. Um, not the case in other markets, of course, but um, that's a place where, you know, people go shopping um, in the middle of the day, you know, between, you know, going home for, for lunch and coming back to work and so on and so forth. So there's, it, it's a very different environment than, than say, Germany or, or, or the UK. I think that's um, very true. Yeah, I think you, you either now want to be looking at markets actually like the UK, where you're probably quite close to the, the saturation point in terms of online penetration, or those other markets where there are um, cultural barriers, I would say, to the adoption of e-commerce. Mm -hmm. The markets in the middle, where you don't have any of those cultural barriers, but adoption still has some way to go, are probably ones where you would be much more cautious. And uh, from from your point of view, SM, um, is that true on the, the lending side? You, would you lend on a shopping centre deal, for example? What, what's your take on it? Yeah, we, we look at this on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. For example, um, similar to Spain and Poland, uh, uh, shopping centers uh, play a different role than, than, than other countries. They uh, sort of a, um, represent sort of the, the, the lacking high street uh, tissue. Um, then, we, uh, then we have uh, luxury retail in, in Paris, which uh, f works very well. Still, um, so it's it's as you said, it's, you have to take country by country, and and I would also tend to to think segment by segment to see if it if it works well or not. No. Poland's another place where retail is, is alive and well. I mean, people yes, people exactly. go to, to go to shopping centers for all kinds of reasons. I mean, not, yes, not just because not there's just a shop. there's no downtown high street right. usually, so the shopping center is the place to go. Yeah, and it was interesting. We were in Warsaw actually uh, only a, a month ago or a couple of months ago. Um, and again, there are discussions as well over the pandemic where, you know, in London there was nobody in offices. Actually, they were still having kind of 80% of people in the office. Um, so big changes there. But but that's absolutely right. That that message came through about the retail as well. I think that uh, that, that also explains some cultural differences um, uh, or, or uh, the 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 environment in which you work uh, at home plays a uh, major role. I mean, you talked about somebody answering uh, the door for Amazon packages, but you can also say that uh, the uh, the average surface of, of an apartment in Warsaw is I don't know um, half or a third of which w w what it is in 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 Berlin or in other cities. So it. it it makes a difference if you if you scrounge with eight four people in forty square meters, or if, if you have I don't know three hundred square meters, and and your your uh, secondary home on, on on the Normandy, yeah. Okay, good. Um, I, I wanted to pick up a little bit on um, residential, just just briefly. Obviously, highlighted their living strategies generally. Um, highlighted very much they were green in all of the elements. I think Stefan on yours. Um, and mentioned by you, Audrey, as well there. Um, does that run across areas as well like senior living, student housing, um, heading into kind of, I suppose, lower level health kind of elements? 
Um, is, is that across the board for that, or are we really talking about mainstream kind of residential? Um, and I'd be interested to get the view on affordable housing within that as well, if anybody wants to pick up any of those points. Um, well, I think there's, there's differences. I think the, the positive theme runs across. Um, perhaps when you get to, to senior living and healthcare, there's some of the, the operational concerns in a similar way to, that Stefan talked about hospitality. Um, student, student accommodation actually has been, been shown in the past to be, to be counter cyclical. Um, so could actually make current economic conditions could actually make that a very, very interesting play. The, the caveat to that is that, uh, yeah, your, your student numbers typically go up during periods of high unemployment, but actually the recessions that we're forecasting at the moment aren't really high unemployment recessions. So, so maybe that's a bit different, but I think it does look like a resilient space and we're, we're still seeing a lot of investor demand and considerable transaction activity there. Um, in, the, in the UK in particular, affordable housing is, a, is an area that, that we really, really like consistently is in our, our preferred um, investment strategies. It's interesting at the moment because you get inflation protection through, through inflation-linked rent-setting policy, uh, whether that continues in this inflationary environment or whether there has to be some, some compromises made there um, for, the, for the sake of the, the underlying tenants. I think there will be some compromises made there, but still that, that story is strong. And essentially, um, I make the point mainly for the UK, but I'm sure this exists in other places, if you're, if you're just not building enough places for people to live, then that, that is a structural tailwind that cuts across all of the different types of, uh, of living asset. Okay, good. Any other views on? Sure. So basically, this is an asset class, and, and along with the sub-asset classes, that far, where demand far outstrips supply. So, you know, um, after GFC, there was a deficit of about 50,000 housing units a year. Um, and building didn't really catch up to that, you know, and then, then we had, then there was more building between, you know, after, after 2013, then the pandemic, things slowed down again. So you have, and this is kind of a global crisis, you know, you have, all, you know, a lot of the, um, the CBDs where work, you know, your workforce has been, the, the, the services city center has been outpriced. Um, you're, you know, you have young people who can't afford to, to buy or even rent, you know, which is where this whole co-living concept comes into play. So um, you basically have, have your, your dynamic across all these sectors is, is demand out, outstripping supply. Um, and given that there's, that requires quite a bit of development aside from the standing assets that there already are, um, is there a risk in that at the moment given the kind of rising construction costs or certainly the the kind of inflation onward inflation in terms of construction costs at the moment is that creating a bit of a pause for people not really you're seeing you're seeing a lot of um you're seeing a real repurposing culture spring up you're seeing a lot of um you know just refurbs or you know um ping, people applying for for other types of use for for buildings so um you know i mean there's a there's a great example of um of a group of hotels that have taken cinemas, old cinemas, and turned them into hotels. So, you know, you see that in, in Germany and in, and in Switzerland and stuff. So it's, um, th there's some really interesting things going on to, to address rising construction costs. And the irony to some extent is that higher interest rates means more renters. Um, because, I mean, in the period of very low mortgage rates, everyone in Europe who had capital bought a house. So, Anyone who could afford that, it was despite high house prices in most places, still affordable with very low interest rates. So we now get more people who will be pushed back into the, the rental market, and have, there will be probably more demand for space on that. But the institutional effort, uh, investors have to offer than in the past, so it might actually be benefiting from um, the current situation. Okay, and we've seen here in London recently deals for. Uh, life sciences, for example, in Canary Wharf, and other examples of those, you know, life sciences beginning to, you know, which is a, a subset of office to a certain degree, uh, but moving much closer into the centre of town, into the centre of the, the, the bigger cities. Um, and data centres, you mentioned as well there, you know, the, an increasing growth in that. 
are those always going to be tiny niche areas um, or is that some, something where you know you see real opportunities at the moment I mean be interesting to see I mean relatively new asset class more difficult to lend against I would imagine ASEM but, but what are you seeing when you're looking at those kinds of things is that something that's on the radar or not well I think we would lend against any kind of asset that we understand and uh, and to be honest I don't understand data centers uh, I already have difficulties understanding hospitality so <laughs> you know, um, and to build up that uh, in order to build up that expertise we need a critical mass and we don't see that critical mass neither in data centers nor in other more exotic uh, asset classes however however there are some some uh, um, Products which we find interesting, such as uh, life science parks, so but they need to match certain criteria. They need to be, you know, it's, uh, they need to have a critical mass. They need to have also the the data access to data out routes and and energy. Um, but uh, uh, we we usually are quite conservative, and so we tend to back away from from things that which are too exotic. Do we see growing demand for those areas? I mean, certainly life sciences. Um, I, what I can't get my head around as far as data centers go is that, um, I mean, certainly, you know, how or, or how it dovetails into the whole concept of ESG. I mean, they take a, an awful lot of energy to run. Yes. You know, I mean, just, and, and plus you have, you have that, that asset class just changing weekly almost, you know, as far as like, innovation and so on and so forth, you know, so, you know, size and, and energy. I mean, it's just a, it's, it's a highly specific asset class. Um, very, very different from, from life sciences where you, you kind of started from zero and, you know, you have a lot of growth potential there um, and you can repurpose and so forth. Okay, good. Um, there's... I mean, it's interesting the the crossover between data centers and the infrastructure side, um, because we've done quite a bit of work on that. We'll have another session on infrastructure actually on the seventh of July. So if somebody's interested in that, we'll we'll pick that up. But there are elements of that 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 come through, and there's a lot of work being done on luring the energy, or in fact, it being placed where there's renewable energy. Um, but you're right; it is it's it's very it's moving very fast that that particular sector. Um, has anybody got any? Any questions? We're almost at the end here. So, is anybody questions that they want to ask? If not, that's excellent. I've got one more, which is really, um, given all of this, uh, I, I suppose, um, where do you see the opportunities? There's. Uh, I remember doing a, a, a an interview with Rick Lewis ten years ago, or whatever it is, and him saying that you know disruption was great it was a fantastic time you know to to go fishing in the market really um so uh, if it's a good time to go fishing where should we be fishing that's my question <laughs> um so where do we where do we see the the opportunities at the moment um maybe let's let's start with you stefan and then work our way down okay i mean so get a bit away from that sector talk maybe around cider trees because last years it was very hard to deliver high returns in real estate because of you know the economic environment and people were pushed into value add and development in order to get some return um, but it was still not particularly exciting but in the middle of a recession in a bit of you know turbulence it's the best time to actually enter these more higher risk um, sectors so that's actually apart from the obvious sector seems we, we picked up on that I think it's a good time ahead for actual development and value add um, coming up okay great Audrey. I'm just gonna say what I said before I, I think um, logistics still has a long way to go um, and uh, not necessarily big box although you know the, a lot of companies are looking to because of the supply chain disruption are looking to store so it's not just about last mile um, so I think that's still a very attractive sector and Everybody needs somewhere to live. Um, yeah, I think on on the one hand, it's a time to to be broad in your approach. I think there's there's opportunities out there if you're able to look across direct, indirect, listed credit execution strategies. Because sometimes we think too narrowly about just 
direct private investment. But at the same time, I think it's also a time to be to be really, really granular. Have you got confidence in that specific tenant? Have you got the right terms in that lease? And then I think you can find opportunities across the board, but I wouldn't be led necessarily by a, a particular sector or a particular geography at the moment. Okay, great. That's it. Well, as a lender, we have a, a perspective which is a bit different. But if I would be in your shoes, then um, I probably um, would look at a uh, specifically at a managed to ESG compliant core strategy. I think that's where a lot of value lies. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting insights. Um, it's going to be very interesting, I think, to see how. Um, we look at this again um, because I suspect it's going to be fast moving and there will be, you know, different viewpoints as well by the time we get into September and certainly by the time we get to Expo Real. So it'll be interesting to see how, how this changes, especially the the interest rate rises and, and, and what we're seeing in the economic side. Um, teas and coffees will be served next door for those of you who are who are here in the room. Do enjoy those. I'm sorry we can't offer that online uh, or if you're watching on demand. Um, but if you are and have been, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.